Nice to have the family all together again, huh? Where's Benji? Well, the truth is, I haven't stopped thinking about you since we met last night. I mean, I had such a good time, I just wanted to keep the conversation going, you know? I didn't give a damn about graduating today. He's bringing a day. Hey guys, how's it going? Welcome to You'll Probably Agree. Uh, today, I have Chicago filmmaker Michael Glover Smith on to talk about a movie that's really been hitting a lot of the waves. Every time I see my friends, like little folk, uh, like posts on, uh, you know, Facebook and all that, it, it, it's like, you got to see this movie, Relatives. It's really good. And I'm like, oh man, I got to see this now. And, and it's like, here's all these screening days. I'm like, great. I have COVID. <laughs> like, what can I do? <laughs> and then, uh, but no, I finally got to see it. And no, it's it's really, it's a really great family drama where no one seems to be like a dumb stock character and the movie could easily go that direction. Like, you could easily make Rod just like the screw up who's like, shut up, mom, I want to play video games. <laughs> but he's like, once you find out his story, there's way more to him than that. So, how did you, I guess I would uh, ask you up front, how did you manage to kind of have all these characters in the same movie where it doesn't seem, you know, like it's overcrowded or you're like, well, I'm more invested in this guy than this girl and vice versa? Yeah. Well, first of all, um, thank you, Mike, for saying that there are no stock characters in it. That was very mm -hmm. important to me, mm -hmm. um, you know, as a screenwriter. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I mean, the character of Rod, I, I think it is kind of a tricky balance to pull off because um, here's a guy who, you know, hangs out in his unemployed burnout, hangs out in his basement all day, smokes weed, plays video games. Yeah. Um, and I think it is easy to kind of have that person come off like as one dimensional or a little bit cartoonish. But um, first of all, I was very lucky. You know, I cast this great um actor keith gallagher who um anybody who knows anything about chicago theater um will know keith because he's very very um experienced yeah, but um you know he 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 found the humanity within the character um he wasn't gonna let it go there you know and he didn't condescend to the character that's i think the key um but the kind of like balance you're talking about um you know, between all of the large ensemble cast members is something that I worked very hard on, you know, when writing it, uh, first of all. And the, the question was kind of like, um, how many characters do I need to have if I'm going to have a big party scene? Because I knew from the very beginning I wanted to have a party that would be the climax of the film, you know, Benji's graduation party. Um, and I've never really done like a large party scene where, with a dozen characters on screen at the same time. So that was kind of like an enjoyable challenge, you know, like I, I want to execute a scene where there'll be 12 people on screen at once, but then, you know, they'll kind of um, break apart and uh, into smaller groups and then they'll come back together again. <laughs> and originally there was going to be no aunt or uncle on screen. You know, originally we were just going to have the Frank family and the assorted, you know, uh, girlfriends and spouses. And then I realized, oh, man, there's only 10. That's not quite a party. Like, it's more like a family gathering. And if people are going to start dancing to music, I think we need two more. So then um, I remembered that the character of Norma had actually uh, referenced her aunt and uncle early on when talking about going over there for Christmas. And then I thought, oh yeah, Uncle Stevie and Aunt jo or um, Uncle Joe and Aunt Stevie, they can just, you know, show up as like the wacky aunt and uncle and that'll like kick the party in another direction. And then I actually thought maybe I could have somebody else show up, like a weird neighbor or something. And then I thought, no, no, 12 is good. Like, you know, any more would be too much and any less would be not enough of a party. <laughs> Two is a company, but three is a crowd. <laughs> uh, yeah, but <laughs> I mean, yeah. So is this story autobiographical in any kind of way? I don't know, but it's just because like it takes place in Chicago. It's like a Chicago filmmaker. I'm like, hmm, I wonder. Yeah. If, yeah. <laughs> well, actually, I mean, I grew up in Charlotte, North Carolina, so I grew huh? up in a very different like milieu than the Rogers Park setting of this film. But um, I do have, you know, two siblings, an older brother and a younger brother. So the family dynamics that you see the in terms of the 
uh, emotions um, of the characters, the love they feel for each other, the frustrations they sometimes express towards each other. That's all very much informed by, you know, my relationships with my family members. But the specifics are pretty different in terms mm. of who these characters are and what they do. Mm. So how did you like kind of like create each of them and like give them their own voices and stuff like that? Yeah, that's a great question. Well, I actually started, of course, with the, the parents. Um, and uh, just like you would with a real family, <laughs> you got to have the parents before you have the kids. Yeah. And um, I conceived of the, the father as being extroverted. And I conceived of the mother as being introverted, you know, because that's the way my own relationship is with my wife, you know, and, and so it's like they say, opposites attract. So, um, you know, that, that dynamic uh, kind of works for us. And I know other couples who are kind of the same way. So um, then I started thinking about like, well, which kids, you know, have in inherited which traits from their parents? Like, um, I thought, well, the oldest daughter, Norma, she'll be kind of similar to the mom in the sense that she won't really vocalize what's going on in her life. Um, and then uh, I thought, well, but the young, younger daughter, um, Yvonne, played by the great Claire Cooney, she'll sort of uh, have inherited her mother's depression. You know, so I was just thinking about um, kind of splitting up the parents' traits, you know, between the four kids. Did you guys have to shoot during COVID at all? Oh, we did. I mean, oh, it was, uh, we shot during the, you know, smack dab in the middle of the pandemic. Um, we were originally supposed to shoot in May of 2020. And we had to postpone the whole thing by 13 months. So that was um, really hard because we were ready to go. I mean, we had cast the film. We had all the locations. We had hired all the crew. And then, uh, you know, kind of at the last minute, um, had to had to push it back and originally i said okay we're going to push it to the end of summer because you remember early in the pandemic we all thought oh this will be over in a couple months <laughs> yeah. um, and then you know sure enough yeah a whole year later um people once the vaccine came out i said okay let's all get vaccinated and just do it now even though we had to still observe all the same you know, protocols, because it was a, it was a SAG film. Mm -hmm. So we, we had to hire a, a COVID safety supervisor and we had to, um, we had to all get tested like every three days. So there were a lot of hoops we had to jump through, but it was worth it. You could always hire Tom Cruise as your safety supervisor and he'll make extra sure that everyone keeps their masks on. <laughs> <laughs> you know? Yeah. Um, so the one thing I really liked about this movie is how the Franklin sort of deal with their issues in the movie because you see it a lot of family dramas when the uh, drama itself sort of gets to the tip of the highest point of tension everyone starts screaming and you know the uh, bottles come flying across <laughs> the room and everything and here these guys actually they sit down they talk it out and you know pro probably like some people go well that's anticlimactic and blah but really most audiences these days are, are a little smarter than that <laughs> and uh i i really liked how you were able to deal with sort of i mean just sound like i'm an alien a human emotion in a way <laughs> uh isn't that odd that you can see real emotions in a movie <laughs> yeah <laughs> right like where people talk about their problems instead of like no have like mom punched dad or something like yeah <laughs> or the other way around yeah <laughs> yeah well you know i i i don't like it when things are overly dramatic i mean yeah. um some you know it doesn't work for everybody uh, some, sometimes people watch a film like mine and they say, oh, I kept waiting for something more to happen and it never did. Um, but I'm just trying to make films that are, you know, true to life, true to my own life experiences. Mm -hmm. And um, I, I have heard people say about my films, oh, there's no real conflict in his mm -hmm. films. And I, I think that's crazy because I'm like, there's a ton of conflict in this, in these movies, but it, it might not be the kind of conflict that you're used to seeing in movies because in movies there's always very dramatic external things happening. And in my films, um, you know, I think the, the conflicts, um, 
might seem smaller in comparison to that, but they're the kind of um, dramatic things that seem like a big deal to me in my own day to day life. Where do you see these guys going? Like after the credits roll, like sort of like after they're all hanging out in the porch and smoking weed together, like uh, where, where do their lives <laughs> go a few years down the line? Well, that's a great question. Um, I don't entirely know, you mm -hmm. know, all I know for sure is where they're coming from. Because as a writer, it's my job to create the backstory uh, of all of these characters, to know where they're coming from. And that's something, you know, that I spend a lot of time working with these actors on. Um, but in terms of where they go after the film ends, that's up to you as a viewer to decide. Yeah, that's that's something I always liked about open interpretation with movies, you know, especially if you go back to David Lynch films and people are like, well, what does it mean? It's like, well, if I tell you what it means, then you're not participating in the process of storytelling. Exactly. You know, and that's the whole idea is that the, the audience gets to play, too. They're not just like, oh, I want everything handed to me on a silver platter. OK, here you go. Um, you know, that, that's uh, one of those nice things. Uh, what, what kind of like movies did you watch like growing up? and things like that. And how did you kind of like wrap them into your films? Well, you know, I grew up in the 1980s. So I was yeah. watching, you know, in Charlotte, North Carolina. So I was watching the same Hollywood uh, films that, you know, all kids were during that time period. Yeah. Um, and I went to the movies all the time because um, that's what you did when you were a kid. You know, you went once a week or so and you saw whatever was playing at the local multiplex. Mm. Um, but, you know, it wasn't too long into my early adolescence before I really became a cinephile because um, our family got a VCR when I was about nine or 10 years old. And I immediately started kind of exploring film history um, when I was a kid because I could go into a, a video store, which was like a library, you know, mm. and uh, I just became enamored of classic Hollywood films. Yeah. So for me, like Hollywood cinema of the forties and fifties, that's like the, the Renaissance, um, you know, it's, it's just, it was, a, it was a time and a place where the conditions were right for um, an, uh, an, ex, an, an inordinate amount of extraordinary work to be done. And I don't think Hollywood has ever, you know, come close to what it was back then. So I love old, you know, screwball comedies, melodramas, westerns, film noir. Um, and I feel kind of sad that uh, I can't work in that era. <laughs> yeah, I, I hear you. Because like original ideas can't uh, sell. I remember way back I was in this class in L.A. And they had the producer from Once Upon a Time, like, talk to all the students. And he was saying, uh, do you, you know, do, most people know who Snow White is and Cinderella is. And, you know, because they're recognizable names we can bank off of that and it's easy money and i'm like yeah that's sad that, that that's all they have now which i mean don't get me wrong i, I love the marvel stuff but uh i mean but that i get, should, get that tired of be it all that, that shouldn't be all that there is yeah because it gets so formulaic so like i was watching Lightyear, and i'm like this movie's good but i've seen it like a thousand times i know what's going to happen five minutes into the movie yeah, yeah. No, see, a lot of people, they think I'm a snob because I have no interest in Marvel, but it's not that I dislike it. It's just yeah. that, you know, I want there to be uh, other, I want to be able to see other things. You know, when I was a kid, um, yeah. you know, when Tim Burton's Batman came out in the summer oh, yeah. of 1989, it was very exciting because that was the one, you know, superhero movie of that year. And then, you know, the following year, Dick Tracy came out. I saw that on my 15th birthday, you know, and I loved it. Um, oh, yeah. <laughs> but but the, the culture has changed, you know, to the point where um, there's no diversity in terms of the kinds of films that are being produced in Hollywood. Like everything is a tentpole. Everything is a huge budget. Everything is part of a franchise. Yeah. And, um, I, you know, I'm old enough to remember when it wasn't that way. And, and, and I know that it doesn't have to be that way. So yeah. something I think needs to change in the culture um, in order to get that kind of to get back to that kind of diversity. Yeah. And although it isn't massively available, like in the way it was, it is in a different way where there's so many like crevices and rocks that people can look under and see some stuff like one movie. Everyone just kept mentioning. And I saw it once. And I'm like, wow, that was pretty good. And I didn't think about it afterwards. But like people kept talking about it was everything everywhere all at once. And everyone mentions that everywhere all at once and it doesn't kind of stop from there, but it's like, I think audiences are kind of 
hungry for different types of cinema, you know, which is kind of the reason why I do my show is it's like, yeah. what if you go to a local pub and you run into a guy and he's like, Hey, I saw this movie. I saw it too. Like no one's above anyone else's opinion. It's something we should all enjoy. And definitely something that shouldn't have like the stigmatization of, Oh, I know more about movies than you do. Like, Oh, so right. you can sit down and look at a screen more than I can. Wow. Amazing. You know? <laughs> cool. So how would you describe the Frank's? As an overall family unit. Um, well, first of all, it's just Frank. There's no, there's no Frank. I'm, there's no Lynn. Uh, yeah. The last name is Frank. But uh, you know, it's um, <laughs> well, well. I think you know what I was trying to do was to create a family that would be universally relatable. Mm -hmm. You know, so um, on the one hand, there's a lot of love that exists between them, but on the other hand, there's also a fair amount of dysfunction as well. And um, I wanted to explore the kind of love that exists between, you know, members of an immediate family, but I, I'm also kind of um, averse to sentimentality. So I, I, you know, I wanted to be honest about how um, family members relate to one another. And, uh, and that means, you know, sometimes showing things that are a bit more difficult. Mm -hmm. um, the fight scene between Benji and Rod early on, I mean, a lot of people have told me they find that to be um, just really ferocious, you know, because these two guys are just uh, yelling at each other, attacking each other as viciously as they possibly can. And my goal in writing that was for them to both be, you know, right at the same time, you know, because uh, Benji is right from his side and Rod is right from his um, you know, I'm as, as a director, I'm not siding with one character over the other. And it was really important to me because I knew a lot of people were going to find Rod's behavior objectionable. It was important to me that he actually scores some points during that fight, you know, because um, it's true, you know, Benji's not as understanding as he could be. Benji is a little bit selfish and uh, a little bit spoiled and Rod calls him out on it. Well, Benji hasn't had a lot of life experience yet, you know, and exactly. the things that Rod was saying were things that you don't really get until you get older. Yeah, you know? exactly. It's like, and, you're, you're 22. I used to be just like you. You'll understand a decade from now. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. He'll, he'll see when he gets a wife of his own and it goes through that whole, that whole fun thing or husband of someone. Oh no, it's a wife. Cause you know, he's in love with the young actress. So, you know, that's good. I wonder if they're going to get, they probably will get married after that. Uh, we'll see how long the marriage lasts, but yeah, I mean, like in my story, they last like maybe like three years or something. And then he comes <laughs> back to, to Rod and then he tells Rod like, okay, I see what you mean. You yeah. Know? <laughs> yeah. I mean, and then he moves into the basement and Rod moves out and he has his own life. <laughs> It's like a vicious cycle. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. That's kind of how it goes. Like, I never see, like, the exact happy ending. Like, people go, what do you think happens at, like, uh, the end of, uh, uh, what was the one where Tom Hanks is stuck on the island, and then he has, like, the, the two crossroads he has to come back? But Castaway. Castaway, yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. And they're like, what do you think happens at the end of Castaway? It's like, he probably delivers a package and the lady isn't home, and then that's it. <laughs> and then that's probably the movie. Yeah, well, like, you know, I mean, that goes back to what I was saying about not believing in resolution. It's like, um, yeah. it's like you know, what what's going to happen in your life tomorrow? You have no idea, right? Yeah. Like, you're like me. You're a filmmaker. You're a critic. You know, how's, yeah. your, how's your career going to turn out? You don't know. Um, yeah. So I, I don't like to leave the audience with a, you know, a feeling of permanence. It's like, uh, you know, it, I, I think the characters will live, up, live on in your heart and in your mind if you, um, if, you, if you hope for the best for them, but if you're not entirely sure. Right, right, absolutely. Um, I certainly hope for the best. I, I don't think, I think overall things will work out for them. But it'll be a lifelong process, sort of like I, I'm guessing I, I could always see David and Karen's relationship sort of like developing more and more as the years went on, especially when there was that whole wonderful monologue from Karen about, you know, how she found her real husband when yeah. she initially had her husband before that. And, you know, that didn't quite work out. But then this one did. And, you know, it was like that was kind of similar to my mom. Like, you know, she had a <laughs> husband who was like very career driven and 
kind of only thought about that and nothing else. So she left him and then married my dad. And it's like, it's kind of like that, you know, it's, it's not the prototypical image of, Oh, our main character got rich and he's happy now. Woohoo. Like it's not that. (laughs) Well, Uh, I'm really glad you cited that scene because uh, to me, what was important about it was she was telling, you know, Karen is telling her daughter, Yvonne, something that Yvonne never imagined about her mother, you know, Mm -hmm. because like, we don't, Mm -hmm. we never think about our parents being our own age and, being madly in love with someone that's maybe not, you know, their current spouse. And, uh, and yet, of course they were, of course they went through that. Um, and, and so I had Yvonne even say, mom, I don't know if I'm ready to hear this. Like, <laughs> like, I don't know if I'm ready to get to know you as a human being. <laughs> right. Yeah, hey, yeah, exactly. And, and it's like, it's like, well, great. Now I know about mom's love life. This is weird. Yeah. Um, so, okay. So outside of the movie, I always have some fun little questions. I want to just kind of randomly ask just because they, they kind of spice things up a bit too. Uh, if you had to choose between no soup and no oral sex for the rest of your <laughs> life, uh, what would you choose? Um, I would, I would give up uh, soup personally, but I would, I would, I know I would miss it forever because there's a lot of good soup out there. Yeah. What's your favorite soup? Oh, I like, um, you know, I like a creamy soup. So, Mm. you know, uh, like cream of potato, cream of broccoli, Mm. cream of anything is is up my alley. Yeah, I've always been an Avalamino guy because of like my mom's Greek side of things. (laughs) Uh, So then uh, what do you have? What's your favorite guilty pleasure film? Like if I were to highlight mine, it would be the Jackass franchise, which like got four stars on Roger Ebert now, the recent one did, which, okay. Whoa. Yeah, I know, right? Like, okay, we've gone full circle. And then uh, Adam Sandler comedies from the 90s, like, you know, like, yeah. uh, but, but what was the one where he played football and they like, they're like, no foosball, like that one. And the water boy? Water boy, that yeah. was it, yeah, yeah. yeah. But water boy and uh, my favorite of all time, Happy Gilmore for comedies. <laughs> Yeah, that's nothing but fun stuff. Um, okay, so I'm going to contradict myself because earlier I was I was talking shit about franchises, but um, I'm a big fan of the Resident Evil movies. Okay, and I I think you know I, I'm the first to admit that the the screenplays are never good, no. um, but it's not about that. You know, no. I think I think Paul W S Anderson is an excellent director, and I think you know. Um, his films are just, they're very well crafted. Um, and, uh, you know, the action choreography is always just a lot of fun. And also it's very, you know, spatially coherent, which you cannot say for a lot of contemporary um, Hollywood action films. No, you can't. I, I don't know if you've ever seen a uh, red letter media's YouTube stuff, but they have like, like one of the uh, movies, uh, one of the guys in it is like just crying, laughing from the scene. And it was like in some scene where like Wesker comes out and like Alice kicks a piece of glass midair and like slices him in <laughs> half in the face. Yeah. It's just like one of the most over the top stupid things ever. <laughs> no, totally. And, you know, but that's the great thing about cinema. It can be like stupid and smart at the same time. <laughs> yeah. It can be. Yeah. I mean, I don't know if you heard about it, but Joker 2 apparently is going to be a musical. Which I'm like, I don't know about that. That's just kind of like Todd. Uh, is it Todd Haynes? Is that yeah? Like he's just kind of being condescending to his audience. It's like, yeah, I invested in this character, and now you're making a joke out of Joker. Which I get the joke, but why? <laughs> yeah. yeah. Why so serious on my end? I guess. Uh. So uh. Da, da, da. Ah. What's the best movie you saw and the worst movie you saw? So like, I guess the best one I ever saw was Space Odyssey, and the worst one. God, I'm trying to think. I, I don't know why, but I always think of Hitman that I like it was like a video game adaptation <laughs> or something like that. Oh man, this is a tough question. <laughs> well, <clears throat> I think my the favorite my favorite movie I've I've ever seen, uh, there's a Taiwanese movie from 1991 called uh, A Brighter Summer Day mm. by the director Edward Yang. And I saw mm. that on 35 millimeter at the Gene Siskel film center um, back in the early two thousands. And it was the most like emotionally devastating, you know, film watching experience I've ever had. Um, It's, it's an epic story about juvenile delinquents living in Taipei. And after I saw it and it, you know, 
climaxes in a murder, like a single murder that's just um, really, really heartbreaking. And I, I walk, I, when you're done watching it, you feel like you've just read a Russian novel. And I just remember leaving the theater and just walking the streets and thinking about it for hours and just not talking, not talking to anyone and not wanting to talk to anyone because I was so just immersed in the world of that film. Yeah. Um, so that would be my choice for best. Yeah. Uh, choice for worst. Mm. This is tough. Um, I try really hard to not watch films that I think I'm going to dislike. Yeah. So it's hard to even think of any. Yeah, yeah. That's good. That's a good answer. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, was, I always have my most overrated ones and uh, I... Ferris Bueller Day Off is always like one of my most overrated ones. I'm like, oh, so this is just like a spoiled rich white kid who gets to do whatever he wants. No, <laughs> I, I totally agree with that. And also, yeah. you know, it's like uh, as a Chicagoan, I want to like that movie because uh, I always, you know, want to uh, boost Chicago cinema. And I, yeah. I've taught a class, a college class on, you know, Chicago movies. And I've never shown that film in class because I, I just can't bring myself to do it. It's like, <laughs> it's like high fidelity. Yeah, I can show that without a doubt. Uh, but Ferris Bueller's Day Off, you know, you got to draw the line somewhere. Yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. Oh, so why do you like put Chicago in like some, uh, I'm going to guess it's a reoccurring thing because this is movie's very Chicago centric. They talk about individual neighborhoods there. They're even like, they're, I think there are houses in Rogers Park and they're saying, oh, when are you going to move to the city and stuff like that? Uh, what is it about the city that attracts you so much to something more than like New York or L.A.? Well, you know, I've lived here um, since 1993. I told you I was from North Carolina. I moved mm -hmm. up here to go to college originally, and I just fell in love with Chicago. I mean, I, I just love the culture here. So um, it's I, and I've spent a fair amount of time in L.A. and New York, but um, I don't know. I think. I think LA is kind of gross, to be honest with you. You know, it's like, <laughs> yeah, it I'm is. sure you know what I'm talking about. It's like, yeah, every, no culture, like, no history. Yeah. Yes, yes. And and everybody there is just trying to make it, you know, they're like, it's like the people go to LA for the same reason that people go to Las Vegas. They, they're, they're, yeah. they're gambling, but instead of gambling with their money, they're gambling with their lives and their careers yeah. and nothing works out. And then, you know, most of them end up moving back to wherever they came from. Um, yeah. so it's like, it's hard to, um, and, I, and I've had a film screen in LA and it's just like hard to talk to people after a film screening there without feeling like they're trying to prove that they're doing something mm. with their, with their careers, you know, and then you kind of get sucked into that. Um, mm. you know, so it's, it's, uh, I don't like that feeling. Um, the great thing about Chicago by contrast is like, even if you're an artist here, you've got, you're going to have a lot of friends who are probably not involved in the arts. You know, you're, you could be friends with nurses and plumbers and, mm -hmm. you know, you could talk yeah. about anything, you, mm -hmm. you know, you're not only talking about the film and the television industry. Um, and I also think, um, I love New York. I think New York is a great city, but it is a bit more overwhelming than Chicago. You know, it is more fast paced. Um, mm. Of course I'm generalizing. I mean, New York is a, very large diverse place um and i love certain neighborhoods there but um on the whole like chicago is just uh you know it's midwestern it's friendly mm -hmm. it's, more, it's more relaxed it's yeah. it's less pretentious you know um yeah. it's kind of the best it's kind of like the best of all possible worlds it really is that's kind of why i always stuck stuck around here like i lived in la for a bit and that whole thing and i'm like yeah no one's just like people actually want to get to know you in chicago and yeah like, they're not like what can i get from you instead you know and that, it was weird like the first time i went to la all i would hear when i would just i just like go out and have like you know like a burger or something and all i hear is like oh i saw this film and i'm like i like that yeah. so at a certain point i'm like will someone just talk about the freaking baseball game or something like yeah. just anything else exactly. right now instead of work around yeah. me but yeah but no, that's... also, Mike, I want to say um, mm -hmm. in terms of filmmaking, yeah. Chicago is such a great place to make films because mm -hmm. um, I think the focus here is kind of on the work. You know, I feel like um, people here come together uh, no matter what your job is. On the, If you're a part of a crew, if you're an actor, if you're a writer, director, it's kind of like everyone's just trying to create something good. And that's where the focus is. And I think 
when you watch independent films from Chicago, you get that feeling. It's like, mm -hmm. here's a bunch of people who like have a strong work ethic and like they're, they're all just trying to tell a, a story that they all believe in passionately. Whereas um, if you see films made in other parts of the country, you're more likely to see something where it feels like, oh, this person is trying to create a film that's like a calling card, you know, to in order to get financing for the next one. Or like, I'm trying to get into Sundance or I'm trying to get 824 mm. to buy the film. Um, in Chicago, it's just about like, let's let's create something good that we can be proud of. Right. There isn't a, an end goal of like, you know, the, the the Oscar in the corner or anything like that for the filmmaker, you know, yeah, <laughs> which could be a very, I, um, I mean, there's a million stories about people from L.A., but that's that's always what I like about Chicago. It's like people care about each other and it's a community more so than it is a melting pot of ego, you know, yes. which is uh, sort of, hey, L.A., if you want to pick up. You'll probably agree, by the way. Uh, we're here to come down. <laughs> All right. Anyways, uh, where can we find your movie? Uh, where is it available? I think it's still playing. A, is it still playing at Gene Cisco Film Center? Well, it is. I don't know when this interview is going to go live. Um, right, we right. actually have two more shows uh, in the next uh, two days. So okay. there's going to be a screening tomorrow night, which is Wednesday, um, June the uh 15th and then Thursday the 16th um, and I'll be there doing a Q&A with um, members of the crew on both nights and then this coming weekend we'll be in um, we'll be in Woodridge on Friday night at the Hollywood Boulevard Cinema oh. and then uh, I'll be there with the, the actress Emily Lake who plays Norma in the film we'll do the Q&A and then on Saturday we'll be at the Wilmette Theater and I'll be doing a Q and A there with Heather Chrysler, who plays Sarah, the cam girl. So, yeah. Um, so yeah, it's like a lot of screenings in a lot of different places. <laughs> and I think uh, I think my uh, buddy uh, is doing the one in Wilmette Theater. Uh, David uh, David Fowley. Oh no, yeah. he's doing tomorrow night. Oh, he's doing tomorrow. So okay. yeah, he's yeah, doing yeah. tomorrow at the Cisco. Yeah, he's a good he's a good friend of mine, and uh, um, I love having him moderate Q and A. Oh, he's, he's a great done, guy. Yeah, yeah, he's done it for me a couple times before. Oh yeah, yeah. We, we all love uh, having David around to uh, do those, uh, uh, do do our questions and everything. He's always our go-to guy when it comes to comic book stuff. You know? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> like I, because I, I admitted, I admit, I'm like the guy who sees like the movies, but I like don't read the comics. Like I read them here and there. Like the, the biggest comic I ever read was like Watchmen. Yeah, and that was it. Same. You know, <laughs> yeah, yeah, <laughs> and that was it. It was like, all right, that was great. And then they're like, hey, do you want to go through it? Like, I got like one fifty dollar comic for like Hawkeye. And I'm like, this is boring. And I just put it down. Right. You know, and everyone and all my friends are like, oh, it's so good. I'm like, I'm never listening to you again. Just give me the Batman comic where he's holding an AK and killing everyone. I don't know that one where he just snaps. <laughs> <laughs> but no, uh, Michael Glover Smith, thank you so much for coming on. The movie is relative. And um, will it be uh streaming relatively soon, or is it? Uh, not until next year. Um, ah. you know, I, I, I should say I've been very fortunate to yeah. work with um, my executive producers, Brian and Jan Heigelke, who have a company called Chicago Film Project. They're also distributing this film. So they want to keep it in theaters as long as possible. And, you know, how I said we're expanding into the suburbs. After that, we want to expand to other regional markets. Mm. So the plan is to just do a slow rollout and to take it to as many independent theaters as we can all over the country. And uh, hopefully I'll be there to do Q and A's for as many of them as I can get to. And then um, we'll also be playing festivals at the same time. I mean, um, we've got some cool festivals lined up, um, you know, throughout the fall. So, uh, you know, I, I think um, we need to kind of milk this, you know, the theatrical opportunity for as much as we possibly can. And then once we feel like we've played everywhere, then we'll make it available mm -hmm. to stream probably early next year. And I think that's a great strategy because movies are always meant to be seen on a big screen, you know. And as I'm always. watching this, I'm like, yeah, I I enjoy, what, like, although yours is, you know, smaller budget and, you know, maybe it doesn't have all the, you know, all the knickknacks and pretty stuff is, you know, something that's like super high budget. It, it does have... Uh, look at a feel where it's like this would be nice if I was just watching this in a local theater 
about yeah. a local movie set in these local Chicago neighborhoods. It'll make it kind of feel like a part of the neighborhood. Watch surrounded it. It by strangers. It. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Yeah. You guys, you know, everyone can smoke a you know smoke a little grass before the movie or after <laughs> it, whatever. I mean, <laughs> it's not like I don't know, but uh, no, I'm kidding. Uh, but, uh, <laughs> <laughs> but no guys if you're around the chicago land area or anywhere else uh I'll, I'll put in the link to your website so then people can go there and find all this stuff and uh, do you have a social media handle i do i'm do? um i am white city cinema on uh -huh. uh, instagram and twitter that's white like the color city mm -hmm. like devil in the white city and then c-i-n-e-m-a mm -hmm. um but the the website the official website for this movie is relative movie.com and that is um that's the best place to find out um exactly where it's going to be playing oh fantastic michael thank you so much for coming on i don't know if it's mike or michael people always ask me that and i never really care so, i just like yeah. you I, mean, I, yeah, I go either way but you know my friends call me mike so uh, you should call me mike uh, we'll call this mike and mike in the afternoon so <laughs> for mike and mike in the afternoon this is filmmaker michael glover smith this is film critic mike crawley from ypa reviews you can find all my stuff if you just go on the google search engine and type in ypa reviews the ypa sensor you'll probably agree See you folks later. Thanks. Say queso.